Dungeons and Drimbus is rated R for rude language, rough violence, and raunchy humor. I do declare, here's what happened previously on Dungeons and Drimbus. As Longreach prepares to infiltrate the monastery, Gary decides to head to a frat party. He meets up with Duke, plays some tequila pong, and runs into Fred, the Vampire Lord, sucking blood from innocent college partiers to get them drunk faster? Before engaging him in combat, before Fred can make his escape, Gary shoves the botched healing potion down his throat, ultimately killing him before he turns to mist and floats away. Gary returns to Longreach under attack by a number of vampire bats. After dispatching the threat, he and Yagen decide that it is time to move on the monastery. The battle looming over him, he rests for the night in preparation for what is to come. I do declare, Your Honor is back in session. Gary. You walk out of the royal palace of Longreach with Yargan. You descend through the upper district and down toward the underhand hold, ready to face whatever challenges await you at Warren's monastery. As you trod over to the underhand hold, you see Yemek, Yasika, and Barnabas near the entrance. Barnabas waves you down and goes, Ray, Yargan told me what happened. I wanted to give... These to you myself. Barnabas holds out two large handfuls of what seems like nothing. <laughs> oh, um, well, I'm flattered, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I, I don't know what I'm missing, but uh, unfortunately, I'm spoken for. So uh, he like strains because he's still in his fucking chair, like all fucked up, and he like pushes one of the hands out, and you feel like a cloth material on your head. Oh, oh. Thank you, Barnabas. Uh, really, thank you. And then he's going to uh, drape it over himself. Yeah, you drape it over yourself, and to your eye, you don't see anything change. But you see Yemek, Yasika, and Barnabas kind of smile. Like, oh. And Yargin grabs one, and he throws it over himself, and you see him vanish. Fabulous. So how exactly does it work? The globamy cloak of invisibility... While motionless, you should remain perfectly invisible. The illusion falls apart a bit with movement. <coughs> but I think you'll still find it advantageous to your stealth. <coughs> Ray, make sure. <coughs> make sure anything you want to conceal is under the cloak. Items sticking out could be a dead giveaway something is wrong. You should be able to see out from the cloak just fine. But <coughs> be careful when interacting with the outside world. If you need to pick a lock or, or grab something, you may need to expose yourself for a moment until you're within the cloak again. You really outdid yourself, Barnabas. I, I appreciate you going above and beyond you. I'm just doing what I can. <laughs> Still, even in your state, you know, you really deserve some rest now. Right. Thank you for everything. It was a joy getting to work with, <coughs> with my hands again. Well, hopefully we can get this town back up on its feet. The people could really use a guy like you here. He nods, and then Yasika actually holds your hands and says, Vince, that creature attacked Ogle's fort. We thought all was lost, Gar. But you've given us hope for the future. Maybe we have found a place we belong. I agree. I think we could make a really good home here for these people and us. And then Yemek, in his weird fucked up state, looks at you through his vaguely glazed eyes and says, We'll be right here keeping watch. If anything goes wrong, I'll be by the tunnel ready to <coughs> sound the alarms and back you up. All right, lad. All ready to go. Let's roll. Okay. Jorgen leads you into the underhand hold proper, and you see a number of people gathered around. And Jorgen goes, Rico, 
We good? Quiet, boom. Right. So, if our calculations are correct, and I certainly hope they are, <coughs> we should be directly under the main chambers of Warren's monastery. Rico will be able to open a passageway directly up, and then it's all us from there. The mission is to take out Ed and Fred. If Silvio's right, it might give us an advantage over the massive fucking swarm. <coughs> but, just in case, I think we should keep quiet. I agree. I think we have a better chance if we go in smart and sneaky. All right, everybody has their wooden stakes. Yeah, and you see, like, everyone who is present in the underhand hold holds up stakes. Yargan actually holds out, like, a little bandolier of stakes to give to you as well. And he says, okay, I know the layout of the monastery pretty well, but there's no saying what they've done to it. We keep an eye peeled for my son, Meryl. We find him, we get him out of there. And any of the other survivors... I'm sure Logan will show his face sooner or later. All those people. The monks. <laughs> your son. We have to get them out of their life. If not, I don't know who's going to be equipped to deal with this mire plague. I have no clue what has been going on in there. I only pray they're still alive. All right, and Rico, if this doesn't work, we'll be... Dead. Right. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Nice and quiet, then. The quieter we take people down, the less likely we are to cause a commotion that will draw them all on us at once. If that whole swarm were to come down on us at once, I don't know what we'd do. It's thousands of vampires. Well, Jorgen, guess this is it. Bless his head. If we don't come back from this, it is truly been an honor. And with that, Jorgen kind of holds his hand out for you to shake. Yeah, Gary will give him his right clawed hand to shake. And he grips it firmly, and he gives you a shake. Let's go. Let's go. You proceed in through the tunnels. It is a long, dark walk. Like, you're stunned by the amount of work they must have put in to clear away this much in such a short time. As you walk... You see Rico making little signs with his hands, and he's like muttering to himself quietly, going, Kaboom! Rico! No! Boom! Nah. Finally, you arrive at the end. Jorgen looks to you as he begins to hood up with his cloak. Ready? Yeah, we see Gary looking around. He's like, Jorgen, where are you? And then he looks and he sees that it's just Yargen's floating head because of the cloak. And he goes, oh, there you are. <laughs> oh, guess I'm always just looking for a little head. And then he puts the cloak over himself. Okay. Rico looks up to the ceiling and begins to twitch his hands in sharp gestures. You hear a vague, soft rumbling and cracking as the ground above you begins to glow. Then... You see the earth begin to twist and churn as it liquefies and oozes around, being shaped to Rico's will into a neat circular opening in the roof of the tunnel, big enough for you and Yargen to fit into. Yargen turns to Rico, and as he does, you hear the sound of a small patch of earth thudding onto the ground. Whoosh! A small boom. Thank you, lad. Jorgen turns to you and he says, Up you go. And he finishes closing up the hood as he vanishes. Okay, I'm going to pull my hand out of the cloak real quick to like make a halting gesture and then pull myself up. Okay. You pull yourself up onto the tiled floor of what appears to be the central chamber of the monastery. The mosaic tile flooring underneath you seems to have been arranged to depict a beautiful flower, but Rico's hole has ruined that. Above you is a circular stained glass ceiling projecting dazzling slivers of light into this large open chamber as the very first hints of the morning sun begin to peek out. There are beautiful ornate stone pillars lining the east and west walls of this center chamber and a statue fountain of some long-haired person pouring a pitcher of liquid into someone's mouth toward the back of the room. 
The pillars on either side lead into smaller chambers that seem to house sick patients. All around you, you hear the incessant beating of wings and screeching of bats from the swarm outside. And toward the south side of the room, you see a large door that you presume must be the main entrance to the monastery, along with a vampire thrall patrolling the entrance. They seem to be pacing toward the front door and have not yet noticed what is occurring here. What do you do? Okay, I'd like to move east to where the sick patients are, and I'd also like to look and see if I can tell if Jorgen's following me from behind. As you take this in, you hear like a slight rustling. When you're in movement, the cloak doesn't work perfectly. So you just see like distortion, and you can tell that Jorgen has climbed out and is now standing near you. I'm going east. Roll a stealth check to whisper. <laughs> you get advantage. Oh, uh, 14. Okay, the east sick bays? Because you see there are multiple chambers with sick patients in them. Or the east corridor. East sick bay. And I start moving there. The vampire thrall kind of makes it to the door and then turns around as you begin moving. Please roll a stealth check with advantage. 14. You successfully move into one of the four sick bays on the eastern wall without the vampire thrall noticing. However, you see she turns around and goes <laughs> and flies over to the hole in the middle of the ground and kind of begins investigating it. And as you are hiding in the sick bay, Yargan is kind of keeping an eye out to one side. Again, you can kind of see the rustling since you know where he is. It's a little easier for you to keep track of him. But you can tell he's like looking back and forth between the vampire and between the patient uh, lying on the floor in the sick bay on a little mat. And you see this is a human in these little kind of like monk's robes, kind of like a, almost like a toga, lying on the ground. And you can tell they are sweating. They are like so out of it. It's that kind of thing where you feel like even if you talk to them, you might be able to get something out of them, but probably not a lot. As they're just kind of lying there sweating, you see there are sores on their skin and blisters that have popped open. And they're there going, <laughs> What is this? Some kind of curse? <laughs> and as you focus in on their coughing, you hear like coughing from all the various different other sick bays as well, kind of intermittently. <laughs> and the vampire is probably. 25 feet from you and she is like crouched and kind of crawling around the edge and she's about to duck her head into the tunnel. Okay, so with that Gary's going to look towards Yargin and lift the cloak up so that it's like from the neck up is visible and he's going to draw a line with his thumb cutting across his neck mm -hmm. and then pointing at the vampire lady and Gary's going to go in to try and take her out. Okay. Yargin sees that, and you just see, like, a thumbs up poke out from under the cloak and then get covered back up as he begins moving with you. Okay, Gary will sneak up behind the vampire lady, and we're going to try and catch her by surprise. Okay, you can definitely get surprised. Are you attempting to kill? Or are you attempting to incapacitate? What, what's your move? Yeah, I think we're going to have to kill. I'm going to go for a silent takedown. Okay. You get advantage on attacks since you are presently hidden and you are sneaking up on them. Go ahead and roll that attack. Okay, I'm actually going to use a cantrip, uh, Toxic Spray, so I don't roll for that. Actually, you roll a Constitution. Oh, shit. Okay. She gets a 10. Okay, and she needed an 18 to beat that. So Gary's going to sneak up behind her. He's going to take his hand out of his cloak, and you see... That clawed hand, there's a poisonous spray coming from the palm. It's just kind of slowly oozing out. And he's going to cover her mouth with that hand and attempt to suffocate her and spray the poison spray in her mouth as well. Ooh. Okay, on a success, I do 3d12 damage. Wow, roll that. Okay, and that's 25 poison damage. You sneak up behind the vampire, and as she is beginning to crawl into the hole, you see Rico and Yimik are there, kind of like bated breath. Yimik begins to run, like to go sound the alarms, and then your hand reaches in over the mouth, and this spray just like, 
emanate out and into the vampire. As you pull her up and out of the hole, like kind of holding her and making the target clear for Yargan. Yargan pulls the cloak up over himself, so you just see him peeking out, and you just see his fist come out as he goes, bah, 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 and just like silently delivers three forceful blows uh, to the torso. You get the feeling he probably just dealed maybe twice as much damage as you just did, just with his fists. <laughs> so much so that like part of the skin peels off as like the studded knuckles on his gloves break the skin on her torso, uh, and you see this like black blood begin to ooze out. However, the vampire who is looking in awful, awful, awful shape is, uh, is still alive. That said, being in this chamber, the sun just barely peeks out and a little bit of the sliver hits her and she takes you get the feeling probably not as much damage as she will when the sun is all the way up, but you see her skin sizzle just a little bit. She goes <laughs> from underneath your hand and she's gonna try and bite at your hand. While it's there, does a 17 hit you? Nah. Okay, marvelous. She is then gonna try and claw at you. Does a 19 hit you? Nope. Okay, she is thrashing just uselessly, trying to bite, but you have your palms stretched taut so that there's nothing to grab onto. And then the claws just kind of peeling at you, but she keeps peeling at the hardened skin where your arm has begun to transform into that new material. So it doesn't do any damage as it is your turn once again. Okay, I want to keep using the poison spray. She is going to roll that constitution saving throw. Ooh, natural 20. <sighs> beats it so uh, nothing happens. Okay, you begin to pump spray. As she frees herself from your grasp, she stops breathing, goes to let out a scream. You see she rears her head back and then Yargan just throws the cloak off entirely to free his arms and fucking just decks her across the jaw. First with his right fist, poof. You see the jaw crack and dislocate out of place. And then he comes with his left fist for an uppercut and breaks her nose off. And you see the like nose jam into her skull. <laughs> As her body collapses onto the ground, dead. And Yargan takes out a stake and drives it through her heart. And then I'm gonna quickly dump the body into the tunnel we came from. You see uh, Yemik grabs it and begins to drag it away. Gary's gonna whisper, get the body out of here. And stay quiet. He says that to Rico. He says, Quiet, boom. Yargin, you see, he kind of like wipes blood off his gauntlets and then grabs the cloak and puts it back over himself. And you hear, um, <coughs> get muffled by the cloak as he pulls it over. Okay, now that that's settled, I would like to quietly sneak back to the sick base. Okay. What do you want to do in the sick base? Well, uh, how many are there? There are four on each side. There are like these mats laid out on the ground. And you see there are buckets with like water and some that are clearly like waste buckets. Okay, anything of note in these rooms? Can I search? Sure, roll an investigation check for me. One. Okay, you don't find anything of value here. You are just seeing the three people. Actually, with that critical fail, you don't even gather, like you think they're vampires for a second and Yargan goes, these are some of the monks from the monastery. Oh, could have sworn they were vampires. Cause they were sweating. Yeah, I guess they look really sick. Looks like the Meyer plate spread here too. You all right? He goes to one of the monks. Well, we're here to help. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> they're so out of it that they're like not responding to your questions. Let's try to carry these guys back to the hall before we keep going. Uh, I can probably carry one over my shoulder. Uh, and he goes and he picks up that first guy that you guys were looking at. And then I'll grab another guy and, you know, together we're just going to try and drag everybody that we can quietly to the hole where we came from. Okay. Yargan walks over to the hole and begins lowering one of them down. Yep, and I'm going to do the same until we get pretty much everybody out of here. Okay. And then the two of you together grab the last person, one through the arms, one through the legs. You lower them in, and then Yargan looks up at you and says, No metal. Of course. It's the beginning of the level. That'd be too easy. So which direction to go? Always go left, lad. I'm going to take Yargan's advice and go left. 
Okay, yep, Yargan cloaks up and follows you. As you proceed into the western corridor, you see a door immediately to your left. At the end of the corridor, the corridor turns to the left. To the right, you see like an open area that seems to be some other sort of chamber. I'm going to try the door immediately to the left. Okay, are you taking any stealth precautions or are you just opening it? Yes, stealth, of course. Okay, roll a stealth check for me. 15. Okay, you go to open the door and you find it's actually locked. Yagen, you wouldn't happen to have a lockpick or a key or anything, would you? I'm afraid not, lad. Okay, well, since I am a conjuration wizard, I'm going to do some minor conjuration, which means I can conjure up an inanimate object in my hand. I'm going to conjure a lockpick. Dope. Okay, yeah, you conjure a glowing lockpick. You don't see Yargan, but you just hear a muffled. Oh, that's sick. All right. All right. I'm going to use my glowing lockpick to open this door. Okay. Roll a sleight of hand check. 23. 23. Okay. Yeah. You pick it with ease and the door gently glides open. And inside you see what looks to be an office. It is relatively clean. Everything is pretty much in order. You see there are stacks of books all around and there is a large desk and there are lots of trinkets everywhere as well like just literally the most random like odds and ends you see stuff like a harmonica Uh, you see little like skulls of odd creatures you see like beautiful jewelry and vases and that sort of thing and then on the desk you see a nameplate that seemed to have said something else before and has been scratched out and it reads fred all right i want to know where the valuables are i want to search for the treasure okay roll an investigation check for me That's a 17. 17, not bad. Okay, you find about 75 gold. Yum. You also find the chalice, like a silver chalice that you gather is probably worth a lot of money. And you also find lots of jewelry. However, by looking at it, you can tell that this will likely add a lot of jingling to your setup if you want to take it with you. Mm. I'm going to grab it. You grab the jewelry and Jorgen looks around and goes, Looks like Fred said up here. You said you iced that bastard, right? Yeah, I thought I did. Hold up. And uh, he pulls out a little harmonica that is on one of the trinket shelves and he goes, I know this thing. Oh my god. (laughs) And he pockets it. The Jeremiah harmonica. He says, bastard. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I want to make it back to the hole where we came from. Okay, yeah, you walk back to the hole. Roll a stealth check for me. 12. Okay, you make it to the hole just fine, but then roll a perception check for me. A 7. Woof. Okay, thankfully Yargan hears it. Yargan grabs you, and he stops you in place, right as you guys get to the hole. And you hear it. And you see crawling on the walls another vampire thrall that seems to be investigating around the office. Ah, uh, shit. Okay, but we're right in front of the hole, right? Yeah, you're like you're like two feet away from it. Okay, I just want to quickly dump the treasures down the hole and stay cloaked and hide. Okay. It makes a, a loud clang as it falls down and you hear a... And you see the vampire begin to crawl up on the roof and then jump down onto the ground and scurries over to the ground. Uh, she's heading right at you because she's following like the same path you took to the hole. Okay, I'm gonna do the same strategy. Gary's gonna take that clawed hand out with the toxic spray emanating from it and try to put it over her mouth. Go for it. Uh, You can hear Yargan like the leather of his gloves gripping into fists as you both ready your attacks. Does a 19 save? Fuck. Yeah, it does. Shit, okay. You poke the hand out with the puff of gas going like out towards her and she dodges around like rolls on the ground and Yagi goes oh shit as he goes and tries to like muffle her under the cloak with a couple of punches (laughs) however as you hear (laughs) as he is beginning to hit her she is then going to let out a scream 
And you begin to hear the bats outside grow frantic. However, it is then your turn again, Gary. What do you do? Okay. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to cover her with the cloak while Yarg is fighting. Hopefully, he covers with the cloak, too. We're just going to try to smother this thing under our invisible cloaks. I'm going to use the toxic spray hand again and just make sure that she doesn't make any noise. I'm going to cover her mouth and nose with the hand and pray. Go for it. Or I guess that's constitution. That is a 13. That's a fail save, baby. Please roll damage. Ooh, baby. 26. Whoa. Baby. Okay, really good. You release this puff as you shove your hand under Yargon's cloak. <laughs> and you hear... <coughs> as they're kind of tumbling about, she is trying to scramble out. You see the arms crawling out from under the cloak. Then you see one of Yargon's fists grab her by the hair and yank her back under the cloak. You hear just a big... As his fists come down on the top of her head, she falls down, slams her chin on one of the ceramic tiles. Uh, however, she then claws at Yargan. She gets a good gash right where his injury was. As she claws into him, and then he chambers up another fist, locks it, loads it. She lunges at him, kind of removing the cloak entirely, and then he punches her straight in the forehead. And she goes flying back out of the cloak as he tries to cover himself again. However, at this point, just as Jorgen finishes pulling the cloak back over, you see a first swarm of bats break in through a window. As the swarm begins to fly around, looking for you. They do not find you. However, there is now a swarm of bats in here, and a very angry vampire who does know where you are, as it is now your turn, Gary. Okay, I'm just gonna take the hide action. Okay. And hopefully the cover of the cloak keeps me hidden. Okay. Roll a stealth check with advantage. The swarm of bats actively looking for you and her knowing where you are would have given you disadvantage. So roll it flat. 15. Okay, 15. <laughs> I'm going to say it meets it, beats it on your hide. So you just barely kind of slink. You see her eyes are kind of tracking the distortion as you move, but then kind of loses you. And you get the feeling that they don't know where you are as you sit still. It is then Yargan's turn, and Yargan is going to try and hide as well, moving out of the fog. You can see the fog, like, kind of twisting around him. And he is going to kick at the ground very subtly. And you hear, no! And you see the ground bubble and close up so that the hole disappears. And then the swarm of bats is going to search for you again. Wow, they cannot get above single digits on their searches. The swarm of bats is flying around frantically as you then see a second swarm of bats flies in to join them. And the vampire throng is going to look for you. She does not manage to find you as she is beginning to look around frantically. And you hear the bats growing louder and louder as they continue to stream in through different corridors. It is your turn as you see swarms of bats begin to stream in. And you hear them begin to go... You hear, like, these little screeches kind of growing louder and louder. Okay, I just want to make sure I still have eyes on Yargan. Yargan is relatively close to you. Okay, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to just head down the left corridor stealthily. You know, I want to hide. Okay, where are you trying to hide? Uh, I'm going to go around the corner, run into the office, close the door, and hide and stay still. Hopefully the cloak keeps me hidden. Yeah, I'll, I'll say you can make it with a full dash. Uh, roll a stealth track for me. 15? 15 will do it. As you begin to move, you see this odd thing happens where both of the swarms were actually diving towards your location under the cloak, despite the fact that you are under this invisible cloak. Uh, however, as you dash and you turn around the corner, you see them kind of flutter back up into the sky, and you get the feeling that you may have lost them as the vampire proper seems to be more lost and is kind of scanning around the room looking for someone. You hear a screech up <laughs> as something happens off in the distance, and then you hear this swarm. They both get in that 20s. Oh. You hear the swarm intensify. <laughs> and then you hear, <laughs> and you hear like a squish 
as something bangs against the office door, like a little thud, and you hear Yargin yell out, what? They're here! They can see through it! We have to find the two! And you hear little dwarven footsteps run off down a hallway as swarms begin to chase him. Oh, I just got Yargin killed. Okay, uh, <laughs> um... Do, where, so both swarms are chasing him right now? Yeah, you see both of the swarms that were in the room following Yargan down, but you also hear the continual stream of more bats into the monastery. In fact, aside from the two swarms that are already chasing him, there is now a third swarm beginning to pour in ahead of him, and then there are probably two more swarms already in the main chamber you see pouring in and flying around. Does Yargan look okay as I see him run off? From looking at him, you see blood gushing from his neck and his hands. How's his cloak? You see, like, bits of the cloak hanging off. You get the feeling he's having a hard time keeping it on, and you can also tell it is torn in places. All right, I gotta help my bro out. So, assuming that he's willing, I'm going to cast Vortex Warp and pull him in with the spell into the room. Yeah, you... And he appears, like, in the office behind the door. <laughs> And he, like, covers his own mouth as he's coughing. Yagen, you all right? And with each cough, like, that kind of effort that comes out, you see blood spurt out of his wounds. And he goes, ah! Oh, lad. Oh, this is no good, lad. Sorry, Yagen. Guess I really fucked the spaghetti now, huh? It's okay. Thank you for getting me out of there. <coughs> guess the vampires can see us after all. I... I'm sorry, I, I couldn't. I tried to subdue her as quickly as I could. I failed. It's all right, we're still in this. Yeah. Hey, uh, what about time? Maybe the sun can help us out. It's getting to be early. I wouldn't be surprised if they all come inside. No, no, that's no good. We don't want more coming in. Uh, so I don't understand. I guess the cloak was working before on the regular vampire, but now with all these swarms, they can see right through it? I guess so. It seems, and he's, uh, he's holding one of his wounds, he goes, it seems like it was pretty useful against regular vampires, but when they're swarming like that, uh, no dice. That warp thing you did, how often can you do that? That was my last one for the day. Crap. Well, now how are we gonna get by? We could always try a distraction. What'd you see down that corridor you were running before I warped you over here? Good news and bad news. End of the corridor, turns left, more doors. Uh, however... To the right, large chambers. It looks like a resting area. But I saw plenty of vampires awaken from their slumber. But further in, I think I saw a coffin. A coffin? Could be Fred's. And, uh, how many vampires you saw start waking up? Probably about eight. Eight more waking up. Swarms of bats. Not to mention... I'm pretty sure those bats can turn into vampires when needed. You see, he sits up and he's kind of inspecting himself, trying to stop some of the bleeding on the more serious wounds. And he, like, wipes off a little squished bat eyeball off his shoulder. And goes, Ugh. So we need a distraction. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to conjure up a glowing alarm clock, because everything I conjure glows. And I'm going to wind it up to go off soon and I'm going to open the door and <laughs> throw it down the hallway. Okay. And I'm going to hope that all the noise, you know, distracts and causes the swarm to come by over and, and maybe we can sneak away with the all the noise going on. Beautiful. Okay. Roll a... Yeah, you know what? Let's call it that. Let's call it a dexterity check. God. <laughs> The six. You throw it, and it doesn't, like, fall in the room with you, but you, like, totally miscalculate, and it just bangs on the wall directly ahead of you and lands outside the door of the office. As you shut the door, and then you hear a... And you just hear... As the swarm outside is like a fucking hurricane out the door. And Jorgen is just like, he's there, he's gripping the chain whip, and he's holding his wounds, and you just see sweat begin to pour down his white face. Okay, I'm just gonna despawn the clock and spawn a wooded blank. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try to use it to block the door, and then just 
find somewhere to hide in this off. Yeah, the alarm clock disappears, <laughs> and then the wooden plank appears. You shove it in, and it goes, stop fucking sick, as he whispers to not be heard, and you guys kind of look around the office. Okay. What? Wait, what was that? Enough. Enough. Everyone scare us. And you hear a voice from outside. Fuck. Where are you? Don't know how you got in. But we were expecting you. You must be the bastard that hurt my friend. You'll pay for that. You hear the swarm like part as someone walks past the door and then the swarm closes back up. Where were they? We, we heard the alarm here. <laughs> And they gesture to the door, and you hear someone begin to take steps toward the door as the doorknob jingles, but is held in place by the wooden plank. What do you do? I uh, bite Yargan's neck and pretend to be one of the vampires. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, Lord, yeah. is there any way for you to get to that chamber? Yeah, I think I can make a break for it. They are all held up right outside that door. Your plank isn't going to hold them for long. I can stay here if you can get to the chamber. And he puts another stake in your hand and he says, Finish, Fred. Oh, I love that. I'll hold them off as long as I can and then you need to get back here and help me. Or else we're both toast. You think you'll be able to stay hidden in here? He might not be able to see me, but the bats might. But you see, Jorgen begins like very quietly, like moving over towards the desk to kind of take cover behind it with the cloak. Okay, I'm going to cloak up myself and try and stick close to the wall or a corner or something and stay hidden. We're doing this for everyone back home. Don't let them down, lad. We're halfway there. Two and a half men? Oh no, I don't watch anything like that. This, this is the Halftime Pad with Nikki B. Nikki, talk to me. There's no time. But I don't understand. Where are we going? What's the place you've sworn to never go again? The end time zone. What? But the season isn't over yet. We've still got tons of episodes. No. Not the Drimbus end time zone. My personal end time zone. What does that mean? <sighs> Scruffles, you still got some coffee? You know we don't go anywhere without the scrumptious, roasty flavors of the coffee from women-owned farms in Colombia. And so cheap with 10% off when you use code DRIMBUS at geekgrindcoffee.com slash DRIMBUS. That's right. But Nikki knows not the time. Just make me a new brew while I... Monologue dramatically, please. Oh, go ahead. Scruffles. Have you ever questioned the nature of your reality? I mean, you're my canonical, now deceased pet hamster. But where did you come from? Why weren't you mentioned until we were dozens of half times in? <laughs> Yes, we just assumed. Who are we? There's a Nikki B out there. A player named Nikki B. A character played by a different player named Nikki B. And then there's... Nikki Me. What are you getting at? And why are we only ever halfway there? We've been at it for over a hundred episodes. Why aren't we three quarters of the way there? Four-fifths of the way there. Twelve-eighteenths of the way there. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Just maybe. We've been holding ourselves back. Because we're afraid of what lies on the other side. There are two sides to every coin. Eternally facing away from each other. What were to happen if the head met the tail? Oh, fuck, that's good coffee. And don't forget to support your favorite podcast by using code Trimbus to get 10% off at geekcarncoffee.com slash Trimbus. Scruffles, your plugs have gotten so good. 
I'm so proud of you. And they also have teeth. You're goddamn right they do. But I still don't get what you mean by your personal end time zone. You will soon enough, my friend. Nikki? Are you crying? Listen to me, Scruffles. Whatever happens, you have to promise me one thing. Anything. Never forget them. The patrons of patreon.com slash Drimbus. How could I? They are the pillars that support all which we hold dear. Every name is engraved in my heart. Speak their names to me now, Scruffles. Queso Loco, Jerry Benetados, <laughs> Victoria Madrid, Greta and Benyera. Yeah, yeah. Alex keeps my ass. Yeah. Ace Andrews, Regina Russell, mm. Salty, Sam Olivos, yeah. Jordan Khan, yeah. the unnamed rogue, That's right. John Gillette, yeah. NB Star, Doubtful Guest, mm. Michael Richters, yeah. Davis Walden, Denny Dewdrop, Myth Mouse, Callie Wolf, yeah. Brandon M. Bishop, Bridge, Twiglets, mm. Joanna, mm. Westberger, yes. Stan. those names up tight. Hold them deep in your heart and never let them go. I won't, Nikki. Then let's go. It's time to face our destiny. doing this for everyone back home. Don't let them down, lad. As he pulls the cloak over himself, and you can kind of see the distortion hide, like, under the desk. And finally, the door busts open. Rot! Where are you? As you see this man in, like, thick, very elegant, but muddied, worn boots, this, like, rough denim-like material, almost pants, and this uh, sleeveless vest with a bald head and a fat chin walks in and he goes, Don't draw this out more than you have to. And now that the door is open, I'm going to cast Misty Step, and now that I can see the hallway through the crack in the door, just teleport down the corridor. Gorgeous, yeah. You Misty Step. And as you do, you kind of get a better glimpse of everything that's going on in the hallway. So you see this man who you presume must be Ed entering the room. You see a swarm of hundreds of bats at this point, just like crammed in the fucking hallway. In fact, as you miss these step, you get the feeling that almost like maybe like an individual bat notices you, but in the swarm kind of like just the signal gets lost in the shuffle. And then you see a group of maybe like five or six thralls, basically near where you missed the step two, but since you're in your cloak, they don't see you as you land down uh, probably 20, 30 feet from them. Okay, well, still being cloaked, I think I'm gonna cast Bonfire on Ed, if I can still see him. Oh, dope! That is a, oh, but he has a pretty big modifier. That is a 14. And that fails. Oh, sweet. Okay, how much damage does he take? So that's going to do 12 damage. You cast a bonfire and you see Ed leaps back, but his vest has lit fire and he goes, shit, shit, oh, fuck. Oh. And he rips off the sleeveless vest and tosses it aside. And he is now standing there just shirtless and fucking rippling. As he goes, all right, we're playing dirty, are we? And he flicks his hand forward, and you see the bats fly into the room. 
However, you are now in this chamber where there's a large open area with very nice, smooth tile flooring. To your left and your right, you see bunkers full of eight beds each side. However, they are presently empty and the doors are open as you gather that the probably 16 vampires at least that were sleeping in here just now have now rushed out toward the hallway and are dealing with Ed. And directly ahead of you, so to the north side, you see another chamber with a series of coffins. And you see one of them seems to have a bloody handprint on it and is like closed shut, but like slightly ajar. Okay, I'm going to carefully walk over there and open that coffin. You walk up to the bloody coffin You go to grab the lid, and it is, like, not even placed well on its hinges as it just very easily pops on. And within the coffin, you see this man lying there, an eye drooping out of the socket, just flesh, like, spilling out like he has too much mass for his skin bubbles and growths on the neck and the legs, blood dripping down his mouth, this dark, black, ugly, coagulated blood. As he opens the one eye that can still open out at you and goes, (laughs) and at this point you hear a (laughs) from down the hallway. Is that all you got, cunts? Gary, what do you do? I drive a wooden stake into Fred's heart. You literally see he's like, he's breathing and trying to... He becomes paralyzed. I cast poison spray as I cover his face with my hand. (laughs) Yeah, the gas goes in. He is gassed as he's paralyzed. He can't breathe. You see all this strain in his body you can almost hear his intestines twisting and turning as and blood begins to ooze out of his mouth as he falls forward still heavy and dead out of the coffin okay now i gotta run back to help yargan still trying to stay as close as i can as you run to the entrance in the hallway you see a number of bats have fallen to the ground, just lying there. And some of the vampire thralls that were standing have fallen as well. And the vampires turn around and they start checking on like their fallen friends. You hear, you bastards! You hear just like the sounds of a brawl inside the office. You're good work, lad! As you see some of the vampires on the ground reawaken with a start. <gasps> and they look at the vampires that are standing over them. Some of them just begin like screaming, going, ah, 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 and moving away. Some of the bats begin to poof into their vampire forms, going, what's going on? Where are we? What? And the other half then begin to turn on each other as you see vampire on vampire fighting in the hallway. And he says, we're almost there, lad, come on! And you hear the whip of a chain whip from inside the office. What do you do? Okay, so I'm gonna cast Tidal Wave to clear as much as I can of the hall as I go down the hall again. Oh, shit. Does a 13 save? It does not. Roll that damage. (laughs) 27. Okay, you cast this Tidal Wave and you see everything. Evil swarm, reawakened swarm, the vampires attacking the vampires, all of them getting washed away by this tidal wave. (laughs) Out into the main chamber. And then you hear the crack of a whip again. He goes, good work, lad, get in here. You can still hear a swarm of bats within the office proper, but the swarms upon swarms upon swarms have been washed away temporarily. You get the feeling that they can probably fly back in within a few moments, but you have a moment to do something if you wish, as then you hear multiple rapid cracks of the chain whip. And you hear, is that all you got, rock bottom? You hear like a crash in the office as you hear the sound of a desk being knocked over. Let me go! 
<laughs> and you hear Yargan screaming as you hear the swarm of bats flying and like small bites and chunks being taken up. Like, ah, let me go! Ah, ah. But it is then your turn. Yeah, I, I gotta run down to the office. You run to the office. And as you do, you see Yargan is being held from behind by Ed. These two relative, I mean, Yargan's older, but he's still pretty well built for an old man. And Ed is a little up there as well, but he has that kind of eternal vampire shine as he is holding him from behind in a chokehold and you see his fangs are dug into Yargan's neck and you see blood oozing out of Yargan's neck and into Ed's mouth as Ed sucks on it. And then you see the swarm of bats kind of flying down and taking little bites out of Yargan's midsection and, and arms and legs. All right, best thing I got, I'm gonna run in with the poison spray hand and give that to Ed. Okay, he rolls a nat one. Okay. That's 17 right there. Okay. It is not a bad chunk of damage as you run into the room and pff, that poison spray up. You see Ed, it's almost like he's drinking like the most decadent wine he's ever had in his life. He has his mouth attached to Yargan's neck, sucking like a, on a fucking spigot. Just... Mm, mm. And then the spray kind of takes him by surprise uh, as he breathes in a... <laughs> Uh, way to ruin a good drink. I'm guessing you killed him, didn't you? Uh, does he see me? I'm gonna argue he can see you when you stick your hand out of the thing. So even if he's not looking directly at you, he knows you're in the room. And he goes, you killed him, didn't you? Gary's just gonna stay quiet and still and hope that he doesn't know exactly where he is. Okay. And he goes, fine. Allow me to return the favor. And he goes to chomp back into Yargan. You see Yargan has begun to grow pretty pale. He is looking bloodied all over his body to the point where if you were to see him on the street like this, he would just look like a regular old man. You know, maybe in good shape, but like definitely not the hero that he once was. As Ed goes to take another chomp, and then you see a cone of flames erupt out over you from behind. You see Ed kind of dives backwards. It hits the swarm, burning up a good deal of them. And as Ed kind of takes cover, it burns into him and Yargan for a bit. And Silvio goes, Ray, I'm here to help. As Silvio runs into the room with his fingers spread out doing the cone of fire. Silvio, you've been studying. Ed looks up and says, Silvio. Long time no see. Can't wait to have you back in the swarm. You're a sweaty Nelly. Why don't you go cuddle up with Fred? As he holds out the fire blast. However, it is then Ed's turn. You see Ed licks Yargan's neck. And he's gonna scan the room. Does not find you, Gary. As he looks around and he goes, all right. You must be the leader, aren't you? And he's just addressing the room in general, and he says, Leadership comes with a burden. And he is going to bite back into Yargan's neck. You see, he begins to drink from Yargan, and Yargan grows paler, going, We'd almost said a lot. Don't let them win. <coughs> and he's going to whip his chain backward. Ooh! That is a critical... You see, he whips the fire chain backwards. It wraps around Ed's neck as his eyes light with rage, and he swings it back down over him like he's doing a wood chop. But with the chain wrapped around his neck, it sends Ed flying over him and slamming into the ground. As Ed is battered for what looks like probably close to 40 points of damage. As Yargan lets go of the whip, drops it to the ground, readies his fists. However, the swarm of bats is then going to come down on you, Gary. Does a 19 hit? Nay. Okay, the bats swarm around you, Gary, trying to get at you. They're picking at you. You see them biting at the fabric because they can see you, but they can't get to you through the thick quality fabric that Barnabas has quilted for you. And you are just in there using it as kind of a little soft shield. However, you do see them begin to take bites out of Silvio and Silvio's like swatting them away, but you almost see he's not being too aggressive as he goes, no, he goes, it's not your fault. We're almost, 
done! And he is going to try and heal Yargan. He goes, hold on, Mr. Rockbottom. And as Ed has been swung onto the ground, you see Silvio kind of like takes Yargan in a quick hug and his hands glow. As you see, he seems to heal Yargan a little bit. Some of the deepest wounds begin to like stitch closed, but Yargan is still looking uh, in pretty bad shape. Gary, it is your turn. <laughs> Gary's going to run over to Ed and slam his mouth on... Sorry, slam his hand on Ed's <laughs> mouth. Just <laughs> open mouth kiss him. He's going to slam his hand on Ed's mouth and spray some toxic spray. Okay, let's see how that constitution saving throw goes. That is a 22. All right, well... He's fine. As you slam your hand, it then becomes his turn. You <laughs> release this acid spray, and he almost like breathes it in to taunt you. <sighs> As some of his wounds begin to scab over and close again at the start of his turn, and then he is going to bear those fangs and try and bite you in the wrist. Does a 20 hit you? No. What? <laughs> Shit, okay. He attempts to bite onto you, but fails. That's that. <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes the swarm's turn. The swarm is going to come down at you as well. Okay. Does a 24 hit you? Yes. So you take three points of damage as the swarm kind of begins to feast on your forearm before you can withdraw it back beneath the cloak. However, you get the feeling that Ed now means business as he begins busting out his legendary actions now that he can see you. And at the end of the swarm of the bats turn, he is going to try one last chomp on you, on your wrist as it is withdrawing into the cloak. God damn, okay, he gets an 18. So he goes to bite and you're just kind of <laughs> moving your hand around as the bats are taking chunks out of them, bloodying your forearm. Holy shit, okay. Ed goes to bite at your wrist, and you see Yargan pulls out that whip and then whips it directly into his mouth, tearing into his cheek and leaving a big, long scar that draws down, breaking that cheek open as the flap of flesh kind of begins to drop down. And it goes, and you get the feeling that Ed is very, very, very nearly dead. However, oh shit. Okay, <laughs> with the ire of his cheek just being torn open, he and just bites forward into your arm, Gary, finally landing that strike that he's been attempting. And he gets a critical on it. You are going to take, let's see, I rolled a one, you're lucky. You are gonna take first 10 points of piercing damage as he tears into your forearm. Then as you begin to bleed, you see him suck and suck and suck uh, as your blood is like darker now as well. And you take 20 points of necrotic damage as he begins to drain you of your blood. And you see he plumps up as your dark blood begins to course through his veins. Your hit point maximum is reduced by 20 points. With that invigorating him, he steps back and says, All right, let's see your face. As it becomes your turn, and he puts up his fists, inviting you to a duel. <laughs> yeah, um, spray. Okay, <laughs> that is a 23. Right. You put your wrist out and he slaps it away, knowing what you were going to do. He is going to grab that cloak, try and pull it back. He says, there you are. And he is going to start clawing at you. Okay, he rolls an 11 as he misses. You duck out of the way. <laughs> and then he rolls a 13 as you duck out of the way too. God damn your fucking AC. <laughs> Roll a dexterity contest for me. That's a seven. Five. He yanks your cloak of invisibility away from you, leaving you exposed, and he tosses it aside to the corner as the bats are then going to come down on you. The swarm of bats is flying around you, and you are just swatting them away. 
as it is then Jargon's turn. Jargon is gonna try and clear some of that swarm away from you. And he says, come on, lad! We're almost there! <laughs> Jargon starts swiping like he whips the chain whip around his head on fire and begins cutting shapes in the air. And you see bats begin to just drop dead. <laughs> And Sylvia goes, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I know you. this isn't your choice! Uh, he's gonna look at you, Ray. You see him, like, trying to prepare that cone of fire that he likes to do, but decides against it, as he realizes you are directly in the line of fire. And so instead, he is going to grab Ed by the neck. And you see his neck kind of freeze over and stiffen, as he seems to take a sizable chunk of damage. It is then your turn, Gary. I'm gonna do another poison spray. Oh my god, I keep rolling single digits on attacks on you, but I, I've rolled like four 18s in a row on his saving throws, which plus four is 22. Yeah, he's fine. He's ducking out of the way, just kind of like, as you keep poking your hand out, he keeps slapping it away and he goes, is that really all you've got? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fred always was the weaker of us. And as he says that, he is then going to try and attack you again, Gary. First with his claws, critical failure, as he breaks a nail and he goes, Gah! <laughs> and then does a 23 hit you. Yes. He then grabs you to bite you again. First, you take 10 points of piercing damage as he bites into your neck. And then you take 15 points of damage as he sucks the blood out of your neck and your hit point maximum is reduced by another 15. He sucks and he goes, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's actually not looking great for you. And as Jorgen goes, uh, lad, we've got to do something about that. The last remaining swarm of bats are then gonna try and come down on you. A 16 does not hit. Jorgen begins to whip at Ed again. He actually misses one as it whips into the air but then lands with a critical, <laughs> and he whips straight into Ed's butthole. <laughs> Just <laughs> The fiery chain burns a hole through the tight denim-like fabric and up <laughs> into the, the crevice. And you see this, <laughs> as coagulated blood spurts out of his ripped cheek. Silvio is then going to take aim at the remaining swarm, and he actually does blast it out, killing the remaining swarms of bats. And he says, we're almost there, Ray. Come on. However, you see Ed roundhouse kicks towards Silvio and kicks him in the side of the head as he says, you can do it, right? Oh, and he falls to the ground, holding his head. Then he is going to try and punch at you. Does a 21 hit. Yeah. Okay, you take five points of damage as he punches you across the face. <sighs> Gary, it is your turn. I'm going to poison spray him, and then I'm going to rage. He rolls a nine on the constitution saving throw. Okay, here we go, <laughs> something. You're like a poisonous mushroom as puffs of gas keep flying out of you. And this bastard takes 27 damage from the poison. Woo. Gary gets hit in the head, and, and it angers him so much that... <laughs> He throws a toxic punch <laughs> at Ed, and then he rages after. Okay, we see that toxic cloud begin to swirl around your fist, almost like a glove. And as you punch him across the broken cheek, you get blood on your hand as the poison cloud breaks against his face. And actually, he doesn't breathe it in. It goes straight into his vascular system through that injury on his face. And you see him go... <laughs> And then as you rage, roll 2d8 for me. 16. You rage and this fiery burst flies out of you. As he says, come on, it'll take more than... And the fiery blast hits him, hits Jargon, and hits Silvio, sending all three of them flying against the walls of this office. Jargon, it looks like that fiery blast took out maybe half of what's left of him as he slams against a wall. Silvio looks like he is on death's door as he gets battered around. And Ed, as the fiery blast burns into him, you see it actually burns into that cut on his mouth. 
blasting his lower jaw down and cracking it further with incredible force. Ah, he goes flying, hits the wall of the office, and you hear a sickening crunch as his neck breaks and he falls to the ground limp. I quickly roll him over and stab him in the heart with the stake. Yeah, Gary lets out a primal scream of rage <sighs> as you stab him through. And I look him in the eyes. Yeah, he is looking at you going, <laughs> Good shit. <laughs> as he falls dead. This has been Your Honor. Your Honor features the vocal talents of Nicholas Benetados as Gary Mogbaha. The rest of the world is voiced by your DM, Giancarlo Herrera. Editing was done by Hannah Schooner and Giancarlo Herrera with sound design by Giancarlo Herrera. If you want to support the show, consider checking out the links in the show notes or go to patreon.com slash our patrons get access to exclusive perks like our After the Show show, After the Drimbus, free exclusive merch, bonus series, and the chance to create items for the show or have NPCs named after you. Oh, and don't forget to tweet using hashtag Drimbus to be entered to win a free Dungeons & Drimbus sticker. Thank you all so much for listening, and I do declare I'll see you all next week.